sake of easy numbers, you've got 20 cameras in each story. If you take your top floor and you've got 20 cameras going to a switch and then you run that switch to your, your next floor and you've got 20 cameras running to that switch, but you also have the first switch running to that second switch. Now you have 40 cameras going through that switch yeah. and then you've got 60 and then you've got 80 and a, you know, a 24 port switch is not really equipped to run 80 cameras through it. Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining us again. This is Ben with SCW, another episode of the In the Trenches Roundtable. Today, we've got another installation-focused episode. We're going to be specifically talking about multi-story buildings. I'm really excited about this one. This one is kind of allows me to nerd out, so I'm really pumped. Uh, but we've got an awesome panel of experts with us again. We're going to start off first with Gil Leskis. Hi, hey, everyone. Awesome. He's the director of installation services. We've also got Micah Shear. Hello. She is our COO, CFO, and a million other hats. And then we've last but certainly not least got Cal Brewer. Yo. Yeah. He's our national installation project manager. So super excited to dive into this one. You know, I'm not really too sure where we should start because I've got so many questions, and I'm sure so does everyone else tuning in. I think. First, I want to start by asking the panel a more broad question, more specifically regarding to what are some of the things that you should be considering or we should consider when we have a multi-story building and we're talking about cable? What are some initial thoughts that pass through your all's heads? (laughs) Don't all jump in at once either. Pathways, network, IDFs, I mean, those are the first big buckets that where my brain goes to, and I'm sure Cal and Gil can speak to those. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely want to talk about switch locations. That's probably the most important thing that you can take into consideration. Keep your cable you know, links down and uh, you know, make it a little bit easier to, to establish your pathways. Cal, do you want to talk about the interplay between uh, conserving cable length and also uh, the network itself, because you end up with this dynamic of like, well, do I keep my run shorter and daisy chain? And then how does that affect your um, network traffic? Well, so we've definitely learned this, you know, over time, uh, as we've just, you know, tried to daisy chain switches and, and big properties and multi, you know, story sites. And that definitely creates sort of a network bottleneck, um, you know, that we've learned through trial and error. So I think it's probably a little bit more important first to think about your switch locations and then think about how you're going to get cable from each switch back to your recorder or back to Mm -hmm. your Mm -hmm. MDF. So So to kind of like elaborate on that a little bit, if you've got, let's say you've got like a five story building and for the sake of easy numbers, you've got 20 cameras in each story. If you take your top floor and you've got 20 cameras going to a switch and then you run that switch to your, your next floor, and you've got 20 cameras running to that switch, but you also have the first switch running to that second switch. Now you have 40 cameras going through that switch. And then you've got 60 and then you've got 80 and a a 24 port switch is not really equipped to run 80 cameras through it. Right, yeah, usually we wanna try you know, think about where each switch is going to, you know, be placed on the floor based on your riser rooms or how utilities are moved from floor to floor. So you're going to want to try to follow the electricity, you know, from floor to floor. Usually there's a riser room where, you know, you have wires going from the top floor all the way to the bottom floor. So you kind of going to want to mimic that pathway with your switches and try to think about the easiest place, A, to bring all your cameras in from each floor to that switch and then how easy it's going to be to get cabling from each switch down to the bottom floor. So usually you're going to try to locate a riser room and either A, create your own pathway by core drilling or, you know, from floor to floor or B, you know, just follow, you know, uh, any existing cabling that's there, not existing electrical, but existing data that's that's already in place. Hmm. Makes a lot of sense. We use some terminology that I just want to clear up. You said daisy chain. So that you're meaning like plugging one switch into another switch or? Yeah, exactly. Usually you've got on a bigger switch, you have an input output. um, So you can plug one switch in and then run another cable out to the next point. And there there are times where that's appropriate. um, But if you do it a lot, you run into these bottleneck issues. Gotcha. Gotcha. So it's best to uh, home run from switch to 
back switch to all the way back to your MDF, all the way back to, I mean, you're probably at that point, Cal, Gil, you can jump in here. At that point, you're, you probably have a switch in your IDF that you're running everything to, but you're, you're picking a very specific switch with very specific bandwidth that accounts for everything going into it. Mm. Right. Well, so, so this is where we're going to jump into the life safety portion of this exercise because <laughs> the horizontal run uh, for each floor has to be different than the riser run. Um, life safety requirements state that the riser run is riser rated cable and that is cable that doesn't allow the fire to track up the cable toward other floors. Mm. Once you get to those other floors, the horizontal run, depending on if it's being ran in the plenum area, will require a plenum rated cable if that's the case. And that's typically a cable that's jacketed with something that doesn't give off a type of smoke that can people can in, you know, inhalate and, and get sick from if there is a fire. So those two things are separate things in a cable run between the initial device back to the switch, which is usually back to a patch panel first, then to the switch, mm. and then down through the different floors to the main floor where the, where the possible recorder is or the, the gathering of all your devices are. Um, so something to consider because um, the horizontal cable run is, is going to be typical in multi-floor installations and it has to be you know, considered for any type of uh, new installation where the fire marshal authority having jurisdiction is going to probably check it out. Something to keep in mind. Gotcha. That makes sense. And what if the distance still matters here, right? From connecting a switch to another switch or switch to main data frame? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, standard network distances apply for most devices, 325 feet, 100 meters. And that includes patch cables and everything. So that's the total run. Um, we do have devices um, that we're capable of using and that we use quite often that are switches that, that can extend the PoE um, data transmission for our cameras and for other devices. And so that does help in the run. But with that said, um, there are, there are reasons to keep within distance requirements, and that's obviously uh, for data flow. That makes sense. So that's really something to consider is the data, the amount of data, where it's flowing to and how it's flowing. That makes sense. Now, Cal, you earlier said something, you mentioned like a riser room, and we also were referencing IDFs. That stands for initial data frame? Inter data. Intermediary. 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 Gotcha. Intermediary. So practically speaking, what does this look like? This could be like a server room or an engineering room or mechanical room, maybe? Yeah, usually um, you want to try to, you know, uh, keep all your, you know, your switches located, you know, usually stacked upon each other, like uh, usually electrical rooms or something like that. You know, mm -hmm. I've definitely seen them in, you know, storage closets or broom closets and all that stuff too. But for best practice, you want to try to, you know, keep all your utilities together. Gotcha. Gotcha. And a lot of this stuff would probably be established or should be if it's an Absolutely. existing building. Absolutely. Gotcha. Yeah. A lot of buildings these days are getting built with network rooms that are separate from electrical rooms. Um, there's also, you also have like, I won't say I'm call them plumbing rooms, but they're fire rooms where there's, you can see like a fire sprinkler system pipe go up and down the floors. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people track cable with those, and, and Cal mentioned coring, they'll core right next to those. And you know what you have there is nothing's gonna get in the way. Um, mm -hmm. You know, right. nothing can really mess with, with the big giant fire pipe, so to speak. <laughs> so um, <laughs> we know there's nothing that's gonna stand in the way if we wanna core floors and drop cable through next to it. So right. something that's a lot of people look for when you're looking through these buildings. Right. Like when these buildings are getting built, you know, obviously the, the fire pipe that built that Gil was talking about first, you know, those those are, are they take into consideration that first when they're putting the plans together. It's always, you know, sprinkler pipes first and then electrical second and then data third. So we usually mm -hmm. just follow along with those. Gotcha. Gotcha. That makes 10 cents. And when we are designing a camera system for a multi-story building, are how much 
go, how much does planning out switch location, how data will flow, how much does that play into designing the system itself? Like, are we going to limit the number of cameras we have per floor maybe, or where they're placed, or can you guys talk to that some? I don't know that you're going to, it's not like there's a hard limit on the number of cameras or really even the placement. It's, I mean, it's all a function of, of budget because um, you can, you know, you can buy the appropriate switches to channel a very large amount of data. You just are going to end up needing to invest in more infrastructure and appropriate infrastructure for that number of cameras. Um, that's mm. what initially comes to mind for me. Cal, Gil? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, you you have to actually, you know, understand your throughput. You have to actually understand how much data you're adding with every device. Mm -hmm. And you really do the math, you know, and eventually you get to the point where, okay, the math is exceeding the output of this, of this switch port. Do I need multiple switch ports? Do I need gigabit? Do I need 10 gig? Do I need fiber? These are all transmission medias that will allow us to bring more data through the pipe. Um, the pipe being the, the actual cable that we choose, whether it's mm -hmm. copper fiber. Mm -hmm. um, so I agree with Micah is, you know, you can really, there's no, there's no limit to it as long as you don't limit your, your amount of throughput that you're gonna add Mm -hmm. to to the to the riser that's going down to the main distribution frame the MDF. yeah so, and those i mean those choices also have always all have budgetary impacts so you know if you end up putting so many cameras on your fifth sixth seventh floor that you need fiber in between your floors that's obviously an additional cost so it's not that you can't do it it's that you're gonna have to pay for the infrastructure right you're gonna to want to take into consideration the switch at the bottom that's taking all that traffic from each mm -hmm. floor. You know, the the more traffic we're we're bringing down towards the MDF, the the more robust switch that we're gonna to want to have in place. Makes ton of sense, absolutely. Yeah, I mean we're in crazy days now where we have single mode fiber that can transmit humongous amounts of data. We have ten gig copper. It's never a thing when I was. <laughs> When I, when I was first coming up in this industry, that's, that's a lot of data transmission for copper. So yeah. the pipe is there these days. It's just making sure that we, you know, we, we do what's right as far as our, our calculations and we're not overcharging the customer for what's not needed, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could we, could you speak to, you know, if a building is trying to retrofit and they've got existing pathways and cable you know, networked floors. Are we able to tie into some of the switches that are already in place there? Or do, should we keep things separate still and just run, you know, a new trunk down? What are your guys' thoughts on that? Uh, I think the best practice Question. is to create an isolated camera network. That's, that's something that we strive for every time that we, you know, design a system is to make a fully autonomous, isolated camera network. So it's good to use their pathways and try to mimic their pathways alongside of it, but you know, use a, a different color cable or something like that to delineate cameras from data. Mm -hmm. You're gonna run into limitations, you know, right? if you're putting two cameras on each floor, um, you know, maybe you'll, you'll get away with it, but it gets, it gets trickier because then there's a million questions about like, well, what switches do you have in place and what are, else are they being used for and what other traffic is running through those and who's managing those IP addresses and who's managing, you know, configuring all of that. And, and you get quickly get to a point where you, you really are better off establishing an independent network for your cameras. And that's something we would always usually recommend, like Cal said, right? Mm -hmm. We try to at least. Mm -hmm. All things considered. But, and sure. We can keep it secure better that way as far as keeping it separate and, and having our own security protocols and, and good password, strong passwords and stuff. The funny thing is, is though, we, we all know we've ran into this where it's completely opposite. We have a company out there that we work with closely that said, no, we want the reverse. We want you mm -hmm. completely on our network because they want the control. Mm -hmm. And you know what, to be honest with you, I love it. If they if they've got the throughput, because right. that's always going to be better that they control their own network and devices, and mm -hmm. and if they've got the throughput to handle all the data from the video, they they will definitely have a a, a better a better knowledge of their network and be able to take care of it. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and that group has a very robust IT department who manages unique. that and takes full ownership of that. Not mm. every entity has that. Most don't. <laughs> yeah. And if you don't, <laughs> if you don't, would they lean on someone like us to do that work for them or somebody else? That's where you simplify your complexities by doing your dedicated camera network, because then we know what's on it. We know it's made, what it you know, all of the elements of it. And then our support team can be that, you know, that IT group to a large extent. Cool. I mean, we recommend sometimes those companies that don't, that do have maybe a more um, a tougher network to work with that they understand that they don't, they don't really, they're not really clear on their network topology and how it all kind of interconnects. Mm -hmm. Sometimes getting a consultant involved or an IT company involved is very helpful. And then we work with that, that group, you know, and I think that meeting of the minds typically can work situations out pretty well. Right. And, you know, and, and then on down the line, you know, speaking of the actual physical cabling and cameras, it just makes it so much easier to troubleshoot. It's just the cost of ownership goes down because you don't have to roll trucks and, you know, have people out there fishing on, you know, which patch panel the camera goes to and this, that, and the other, you know, if you have a fully isolated camera network, the troubleshooting time goes way down and it's easier to, to find issues and, and keep everything working the way it should. That's a really good point. Really, really good point, especially troubleshooting, like figuring out what cameras what and on what floor mm -hmm. and all that jazz. So mm -hmm. definitely. In regards to cameras and, and specific placements, again, I want to circle back. You know, because multi-floor buildings, you have to. There's there's a way to get to that floor. You know, usually stairs and usually an elevator of some sort. Um, do you have thoughts or opinions on where to place cameras in and around these areas? You know, in stairwells, do we place them on the landings or just at the entryway on each floor? Um, maybe we can start with stairwells and then we'll tackle elevators. Yeah, we don't have stairwells, any stairwells. Yeah, I'll take elevators. But. <laughs> yeah, stairwells. I mean, definitely going to want to have you know cameras that that catch your points of egress from floor to floor. So you're going to want to have a camera on. Say you have you know your your building and you have uh, stairwells on either side. You know you're going to want to have a camera catching who's coming in either side and who's going out either side. So usually you want to have a camera in the stairwell to catch whatever's going on in the stairwell, and you want to have a camera in your hallways to catch who's going in and out of the stairwells. Makes cool. And the inside the stairwell, those cameras, are they going to run back to the floor that they would attribute to, or are they running back to a switch of their own? Uh, no, the, you, you can penetrate, you know, and go back, you know, from the, the stairwells into the hallways back to the switches per floor. You're just going to want to make sure that every, you know, cable that's in a stairwell is in conduit and you use fire stop to get back into uh, the hallway. Um, hmm. to contain, you know, like Gil was saying earlier, plenum spaces versus riser spaces. That's a good point. Good consideration. Gotcha. So stairwells, you know, egress, egress on, on landings and such can run back to the same floor. That's awesome. Gil, you said you'll take elevators. Elevators are, are fun. Um, mostly because you don't have to do much. <laughs> They're definitely fun to uh, ride. Not to <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, cool. More fun to be on top of. <laughs> right. Um, there, there's only so much we're allowed to do um, legally in elevators. Um, most elevators these days, depending on when they were built, they will have what they call traveler cable. Traveler cable is just a, a, a conglomerate of cables that really offers a solution for all kinds of different electronics and devices, powers, low voltage, high voltage. It's all kind of built in there. Um, typically there's network in there. In the old days, it used to be coax, you know, <laughs> for coaxial um, analog cameras. But now most of the time it, it does have a separate, you know, a couple, you know, separate things to, to use for network solutions, um, which is video surveillance, access control, um, those are all tied into the traveler cable. Uh, we tie our devices to that um, in the car, you know, the, the actual elevator car. And then at the top, um, that's where they, it, everything kind of terminates. Not allowed to go in those rooms. Um, typically, there's a D mark that you bring your cable to, and the elevator will, will, will kind of take it from there, the elevator company. Mm -hmm. um, but that all gets worked out. Um, 
you know, when you're, when you're, when you're working the job, but, but yeah, I mean, um, cameras have been in elevators a long time now and it's a pretty normal thing. And I'm still surprised when I go into elevators and I always look <laughs> and, and, and to see no cameras in an elevator shocks me these days because to me, it could be very, very standard. I think they all should have them. Right. I could definitely see why you would want them, you know, For sure. totally makes sense. If I had a building and I wasn't sure, uh, if I had a travel cable or not, is there an easy way to find that out? Or yeah, they 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 get with their um. If they have an elevator, then they have to have an elevator maintenance company. It's mm. the law. Mm. Um, yeah, so the the elevator maintenance company will have records of what they have in that traveler cable, and they can also add and switch it out too. Oh, so if okay. they don't have what they need, they just they just. It, I'm not saying it's cheap, <laughs> but <laughs> right. but it is something that they do if they have to do it. Cool. So if they had like some of the older analog setup and they maybe want to upgrade or you know, change. Yeah. It if they were out of cable or just didn't have one, then they would, they would have to add it, but yeah, they do it all the time. Awesome. Awesome. So it's, I mean, relatively straightforward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For us, it's not that bad. I, I, I don't know what it's like to run traveler cable. doesn't sound fun in a 40 story <laughs> building, but right. I'll let them have at it. Right. right. <laughs> no, that's, that's great. Cool deal. Hey, Gil and Cal, something else that comes to mind with pathways and camera placements is that a lot of the multi-story buildings we're looking at are things like hotel rooms, apartment buildings, or hotels, apartment buildings. And you you have these challenges in your pathways because you can't run your pathways through individual apartments, typically. How do you guys strategize in the face of that? Yeah, try to try to make sure that you're you know, your main trunk line is going through the hallways. I mean, that's, you know, mm -hmm. I guess when I'm speaking, I'm thinking of, of a hotel, you know, where you have your hallways and you have your rooms jutting out from, from the hallways. So you want to make sure that your, your main cable pathways are from the hallways. Um, and then, you know, jut out, mm -hmm. you know, make sure you have the doors and stuff covered, but yeah, usually on, on apartment buildings or stuff like that, they're not going to allow you to run cable through their rooms unless there's, a, you know, attic space or crawl space above. Usually on mm -hmm. the top floor, you can do that, but any floor in between you're not going to be able to run into apartments or anything like that how do those considerations affect exterior cameras because i i've seen some where we're sort of trying to strategize okay we can go through the hallway and out here but i want a camera all the way on the corner of the building and we end up using a lot of conduit are there other strategies that you guys have seen to um to work around that or is that pretty much the best solution most of the time I think that's pretty much the best solution most of the time. Usually you're going to have a couple of limited areas where you can actually penetrate out and then it usually ends up being a good bit of conduit on the outside of the building to get to the camera location you want to mount. They didn't build these buildings, you know, cameras in mind. the last 20 <laughs> years with that, that in mind. They just didn't. Yeah. So sometimes it's, it's, it's just cable wizardry. It's just trying to figure out best path, you know? Yep. Mm -hmm. And to that Can we point, get a definition for cable wizardry? Oh, I gotta look one up now. Yeah, so, yeah still scroll across the bottom that. of the screen. <laughs> no kidding. No kidding. Mm -hmm. uh, to that point, though, if if a uh, if a building, a, a multi-story building, has an analog-based system, are all, all RJ forty-nine cable run? Are you all able to reuse those pathways, or is it something you don't really want to mess with? Define reuse the pathway. Maybe that is the place to start in answering that question. Sure. Well, can you reuse the cable? You can yep. not well, reuse the cable, but you can sort of use the cable as a pull string. So if you were to tape all the end of it, you know, with your new Cat 5 or Cat 6 or whatever you're using for your cameras, usually unless, you know, an area where you can't access, it's zip tied or something like that, usually you can use it as a pull string to just rip and replace. Mm. Hmm. I feel like we run into it being secured in a way that makes using it as a pull string difficult mm -hmm. more frequently than than we'd like. Absolutely. So I don't know that I would count on being able to to do that, just given, you know, code requires these things to be secured at intervals. And so you're you're having to go through it, you know, go through the pair of scissors and what cut some zip ties every four to six feet. 
Yeah, right. I think that comes back to the cable wizardry thing, though. I mean, uh, you know, just, <laughs> there are ways around that. There are ways around it. Uh, it just depends. It differs from site to site. It differs from from floor to floor. Uh, yeah. It just depends on who who ran that that coax cable when the building was being built. Um, yeah, usually you're right, Micah. They, they are they are secured every so often, and and you, you can't really use them as a pull string, but sometimes you can get away with doing it. it just depends on who ran the cable initially. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So basically, if they didn't do it to code, you right. probably it's, can. It's super easy. <laughs> oh, there's still a ton of cable out there not to code because it was it was installed way before there was code. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Yeah. So, so to Cal's point, there's a lot that's not tied down. There's a lot that's not in J hooks. There's a lot just laying around out there. And so that's <laughs> that's the stuff we like because then we can just yeah. go. <laughs> Yep, <laughs> we're good. Easy. <laughs> That's good stuff. But I'm also hearing definitely don't reuse that cable. Let's get yep. it replaced with some, some yeah. updated stuff. Right I mean, there's place. some real janky stuff out there with valens and converters and, but more often than not, your cost of maintenance on that stuff is pretty high. Troubleshooting it is a complete pain. Um, and it's, you end up spending all of this extra time, like it's down again and I'm going to go jiggle it and mess with the connectors mm. and it's it's really not worth it good to know i want to circle back to something we uh especially cal and gil you all mentioned earlier about core drilling <laughs> please help me explain in english because <laughs> i'm just like core drilling. it's just way over my head from floor to floor nothing you know it's just, oh, just using a, a very large drill with a very large drill bit to be able to make a penetration that goes from floor to floor so you can run your cables downward it, yeah. It's like making a, a cornhole board, but between yes. 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 cornhole board <laughs> in the riser room. <laughs> That's great. Does it require any special like permits or something to get done? It can. Can it can because sometimes you don't know what's what's in those floors, in between the floors. Yeah, that was my word. What did they put in the concrete? Is there any so there there there's companies that come out that that have these devices that can look if you're not sure, I mean, mm. it's one of the reasons why I mentioned, you know, in the beginning, running it along some, you know, sprinkler piping and stuff, because mm. you know that that's going to be a pretty safe space. But if yeah, you're not right. around a spot where you already see cord floor, then you don't know. So they do have devices out there, companies that actually do this for a living, where they, it's almost like an x-ray machine and they bring it out. They can, they can look into the floor and kind of see if anything's in the way. Can't tell you what it is, but they can tell you something. Or 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 the you know buildings plans and specs are done properly. Sometimes that stuff's in the plans also. But gotcha. Yeah, yeah, you can you can run into that. So something to be careful of. Definitely, it's like call before you drill. Yeah, exactly. call before you dig, almost. You know? Yeah, exactly. That's good stuff. And I'm I'm assuming there's some type of like sleeve, or you'd probably want to put the cable and conduit or something in between yeah, the actual you'd... floor going to want to make sure that you're, you know, your fire stopped from floor to floor. So they make these, you know, these special sleeves that you can put in, you know, in the, the hole that you core drilled that, that actually have fire stop like inside the sleeve. And so say they catch it on fire, it automatically kind of like chokes it off at the, yeah. at the, you know, at the mm. floor point. But, you know, uh, most buildings you're just going to see PVC from floor to floor and fire stop mm -hmm. uh, just to make it's sure. It's like okay. Play-Doh. Yeah, just it's, like Play-Doh. It's like red, red Play-Doh. <laughs> oh, nice. Play but it's, you know, fire rated. This works. You'll see if you go into these, you can go into these buildings probably now all around town and see any cabling going up through floors. You'll see exactly what Cal talked about. You'll see like 12 cables coming out with all this little, you know, in this little filled up hole of, of red caulking, so to speak. And uh, it works. Got to keep people safe. Gil, nice. tell me how many pairs of pants that you have that are covered with just <laughs> red. Uh, I've got a plenty. I've got plenty. <laughs> That's great. And uh, if you were trying to look for this material, you could buy it at an electrical supply store or yeah, hmm? Home Depot, anywhere. Yeah. S same thing with that special cable that you needed. You can get that at the same place, right? Because yeah. we need a different cable to go in between floors. Right. Yeah. Rated. Yeah. Gotcha. Be honest with you. You know. Typically, riser rated cables used for most applications that don't require plenty. Most most, uh, most applications just use riser rated and it works fine. 
Gotcha. Uh, plenum's a little bit more, you know, expensive, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess the best way that I've always been told is like, riser, when it catches on fire, it burns. Plenum, when it catches on fire, it melts. Mm. That's, that's what I've always been told. So, um, yeah, it won't burn and pick, carry in between floors. It'll just melt and drip, kind of like candle right. wax. Right. Wow. That's a good way to put it. Well, that's awesome. Good way to end things. And that's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs> With your good. building burning down. Yeah, burning down and melting. <laughs> no, that's, that's really great info. What are we missing? What are we not thinking about? I feel like we've covered quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah, I'm drawing a blank. Do as much planning as you can ahead of time. Yep. Yeah, Absolutely. it's a big one. Planning, planning, planning on several yeah. levels, you know? Your, your infrastructure is more complex because of the you having to think very, very carefully about multiple IDFs. I mean, in a typical installation, you're looking at, you know, an MDF and one or two IDFs max. Um, when you're dealing with a monthly start building, you're going to, you know, you have as many as you have floors. So that infrastructure conversation becomes a bigger piece. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Agreed. That makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. And there you just slap some cameras on the wall. You're good to go. Good to go. And it's pretty straightforward from there, right? <laughs> oh, one thing I just thought of. So if we can envision a multi-story motel for a moment, sometimes they do or don't have like a vending or ice machine, you know, in the middle of the building, which I could see as like acting potentially as a uh, IDF between floors. Um, but say there isn't and <clears throat> the multi-story motel Right, so exterior faced rooms. Should would we be putting this equipment on the outside of the building in weatherproof enclosures, or how would that exactly work? I guess uh, we might not need cameras. Yeah. On that definitely, I mean it's a, it's a it's a possibility. I guess if you have you know literally no locked spaces per floor, but you're definitely going to want to try to bring your cable and keep your IDF in locations that can be locked and not tampered with. Mm. Um, but you very rarely do you ever find utilities on the outside of the building then mm -hmm. going in for your camera locations, um, especially in a motel. Yeah, that's how a motel still has, you know, utility rooms in fixed locations. I would imagine you probably would not have to resort to a NEMA on the exterior of a building. Um, so that's always an option. Sure. Okay. Usually those utility rooms are stacked. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is probably a whole other series, but the other thing I see coming up a lot with hotels um, is the viewing considerations. You have a lot of cameras, viewing is complex. You have multiple different stakeholders who want to interact with the systems in different ways for different purposes. Um, and you end up having to work through a lot of, of variables there, but that's probably its own video. In the trenches, number eight. That's right. <laughs> video viewing. Viewing. <laughs> that's right. yeah that's right absolutely good stuff awesome well i think that's it i think we've covered all of our bases here on multi-story buildings there's a lot of considerations but the most important one is plan you know mm. plan to the best of your ability all the things you should be considering some of the top ones would definitely be data throughput idf mdf locations how things are connected what the pathway right. is of data flow so perfect gil micah cal Really appreciate all the links to some of the documents that we've been created down in the description below. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode, and we'll catch you next week. See ya.